A um, couple things before we get started. Uh, if some of you are new to these uh, webinar programs, um, we will take uh, questions at the end of the presentation, um, but you can go ahead and uh, send me your questions at any time, but uh, just to kind of preserve the flow of the presentation. I'll hold those until the end, um, and then we'll we'll take them from there. But you're welcome to submit them at any time. Uh, also, uh, if you haven't, I'd encourage you to go to www.wwrof.org. People who sponsor this uh, webinar series and uh, take a take a look at the work they're doing, the things they're supporting, and I know they would uh, welcome your uh, participation if. Uh, if you feel so moved. Um, tonight we have uh, Rick Rosen, K1 Delta Sugar, is going to talk to us on uh, VHF rovers. And uh, when I put out a note, gosh, I don't know if it was about a month ago or so, uh, looking for VHF topics, uh, he was kind enough to be the first one to jump up and say, I'll do it. I'd be uh, happy to do a presentation on rovers. So we uh, gladly accepted that. Um, so we're glad that uh, he can be with us tonight uh, to, to go into this topic. Uh, as I mentioned during W5ZN's presentation, uh, if there are other topics in VHF contesting you'd like to see covered or something that was covered and maybe uh, go into it in a little more detail, I would certainly welcome your suggestions. Uh, I do dabble in VHF contesting, but it's not my uh, area of specialty, if you will. So uh, um, if anyone in the VHF community is interested in doing more of these presentations, I uh, would love to have uh, your input. And um, I think it's within 24 hours or so you'll get a follow-up from us just thanking you for joining. My email address will be in there if you uh, want to reach me. So with that, Enough from me. I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to uh, Rick K1 Delta Sugar. Uh, Rick, go ahead. Uh, thanks for being with us this evening. I appreciate the introduction, uh, Ken, and uh, uh, welcome to uh, all all the listeners uh, across uh, across the uh, spectrum here. Um, I'm broadcasting from my home studio. That is K1DS. We're located in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. Uh, I am a member of the uh, Pack Rats, the Mount Airy VHF Radio Club. And uh, prior to that, I was a, a charter member of the uh, Northeast Weak Signal Group. Um, and why did I become a rover, and how do I know about this stuff? Uh, well, I've been roving probably now for uh, 25 or tw 26 years. Um, I lived in a uh, home in Providence, Rhode Island, where there was a 120-foot uh, hill that rose immediately uh, to the west of my house so that uh, broadcasting uh, towards the west um, was uh, really problematic. And uh, back in uh, 1991, um, the uh, uh, category of rovers was developed. Now, uh, roving started even before uh, the ARRL uh, coined, uh, coined the category or added the category to their VHF contests. Uh, long, long time ago, the um, uh, Motorola Radio Club and, um, okay, so this is one that we need to get rid of. So, yeah, there you go, down to four hours, okay. For folks that join us, uh, this popped up as we were getting ready and uh, we were just waiting for it to come up again. Go ahead, Rick. Um, the um, the uh, uh, Microwave Associates uh, group uh, up, in, um, up in New England had uh, difficulty uh, finding contacts, and uh, back then we were talking about ARRL sections as opposed to grids. And so uh, they would uh, uh, build a station uh, for uh, certainly the microwaves. You could find uh, operators on 6 and 2 meters, occasionally on 220 and 432, but uh, above that, uh, contacts were seriously lacking. So uh, these clubs, with their depth and certainly their technical know-how, uh, built stations and uh, deployed operators to them on various mountaintops across uh, the states of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and, uh, um, and so on, so that they could run up uh, good uh, section multipliers at that time. Uh, W2SZ, which was now called the Mount Greylock Expeditionary Force, um, and uh, uh, WA2AAU, which is Dick Fry, uh, kind of developed a lot of equipment with the Rensel Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute uh, in, um, uh, outside of Albany in Rensselaer, New York, 
uh, they couldn't win the contest uh, despite having a wonderful VHF uh, location on Mount Greylock in western Massachusetts uh, because they didn't have uh, uh, the ability to get all those uh, contacts with all those distant um, stations that were being put up by uh, W1DC or W1FC um, and so they developed a, a set of rover equipment and uh, basically taught a lot of uh, amateurs how to use uh, the equipment and the microwaves. Unfortunately, one of the things that they did was to use a real oddball IF, and as a consequence, uh, those of us who operate uh, the microwave bands, uh, that is 903 and up, uh, are, uh, are hardly able to contact uh, the rover stations uh, from W2SZ and basically uh, they go out and run a route and, and talk to the uh, home station. What's the value of rovers? Basically I can tell you that uh, the W2SZ gang uh, has about 50% uh, of its score uh, provided by their rover stations uh, because of all the multipliers and the uh, microwave contacts that they provide which are uh, those high point uh, QSOs for uh, for four points each uh, once you get uh, once you get above uh, 1296. So uh, what happened over time is that uh, since this uh, became an activity that the ARRL became aware of, uh, they decided that they would make a rover category. And actually, in June of 1991, the rover and multi-limited categories were developed after a series of articles in the National Contest Journal. And they galvanized popular support for the creation of these new categories. The rules were published in the May 91 QST. And uh, here are the basic rules. The rover class is one or two operators of a single station that moves along two or more grid squares during the course of a contest and quote all rovers are encouraged to adopt operating practices that allow as many stations as possible to contact them and uh, basically in in uh, those uh, early days uh, the scoring system uh, was different uh, than it it currently it currently is uh, you were able to uh, add all the grids uh, that you worked uh, from uh, from each uh, grid that you were in and so the scores were often colossal. Uh, before I go further I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, one of the silent keys who was certainly a stellar rover. Uh, this is Bill Seabreeze who was a w W3IY. Um, we made Bill an honorary uh, pack rat uh, prior to his uh, passing and uh, in his memory, um, we've also uh, developed a, a rover recognition award, which I'll discuss in a second. Um, you can see Bill's rover here as he uh, used to go maybe to uh, 10 or 12 grids uh, during a contest. And he was extraordinarily well equipped, as you can see, uh, with all bands uh, through the high microwaves and uh, provided tons of contacts for uh, the amateurs uh, up and down the Atlantic coast and uh, slightly inland. Um, so in his memory, uh, the, uh, our club uh, developed the Rover Recognition Award and uh, we've given it out for the past seven years to uh, somebody who has uh, exemplified the attributes that uh, uh, Bill uh, uh, had in giving out so many QSOs on uh, all different uh, bands from multiple grids. So uh, this uh, award is presented each year and it's based on uh, the rover entries uh, that are in uh, QST. Uh, not necessarily the highest scores uh, because uh, there, there are unique issues involved uh, in scoring which we'll also discuss in a bit. Uh, but uh, sort of the uh, wonderful uh, uh, sportsmanship that was demonstrated by Bill Seabreeze in, in uh, talking to all and everybody uh, who was capable of working him. So uh, we've talked a little about the history um, and, and since uh, 
ARRL has adopted the category, there have been a lot of changes to the rover rules. Currently, uh, there are three classes of rovers. Uh, there is the what we call the regular rover uh, or the standard rover category, which says you can operate as many bands as you can. Uh, you can have only one or two operators, although you can have any number of different drivers, and that all equipment must be transported in uh, one vehicle, and that includes the power source, uh, the radios, and the antennas. Um, there is the limited rover class now, which was developed because what happened is that uh, rovers who were equipped with 10 bands, much like uh, Bill or myself, uh, had uh, ha had a dramatic advantage over rovers who went out with uh, the basic uh, IC706 or uh, or the Yezu uh, uh, 740, I think it's uh, 757 or I'm not sure of the numbers, but basically these are rigs that had six meters, two meters, and 432, um, and uh, certainly um, a lot of people have added 222 FM or 223.5 FM uh, to operate the bottom four bands. Uh, interestingly enough, there was a time when the limited rover was four bands, and what happened was uh, one industrious uh, club uh, out in the West decided to equip a station uh, with um, the high the high scoring bands uh, that is the four point per CUSO uh, two gig three gig five gig and ten gig and uh, of course ran away with the uh, the uh, high scoring award for that year so uh, that loophole was sort of fixed to say yes it's the bottom four VHF bands six two two twenty uh, 222 uh, and, uh, and 432. Uh, the other uh, category that was uh, added was called the unlimited rover. And the reason that this category was added was that uh, there were some strategies and tactics which were felt to be uh, somewhat um, highly uh, unsportsmanlike for club entries. And um, what happened was that uh, uh, rovers were doing what we call grid circling, that is one rover would uh, be in the grid adjacent to another rover and then they would work themselves on the bands and then uh, they would switch grids and then work themselves on the bands again uh, and then maybe uh, one of the rovers would go to uh, the next corner and uh, then they'd work themselves on the bands again and so on and so forth. And actually, this tactic was used um, back in 1992 or, or 93. Um, uh, KA1ZE and N1DPM, uh, both with a family member who was a licensed TAM, so that came under the family uh, station operating, uh, did this kind of, uh, of uh, roving across eight grids. They, they did it on two, four. Um, uh, four corner grids and um, uh, they each scored 1.2 million points and uh, they, they these four stations actually there were only two vehicles because each vehicle had uh, a, uh, a two two licensed operators in it who were a family station and then they added their uh, club to to their club score and they aggregated six million points certainly something unheard of today um, so, so what happened was that uh, the the idea of uh, grid circling and rover to rover contacts, although it certainly increased activity, uh, was um, limited now. So that rover to rover contacts are limited to 100. Uh, if uh, that is one uh, one particular rover to any other particular rover, um, and uh, what what's happened is that uh, the unlimited rover can can do almost whatever they want. They can make more QSOs with uh, with other stations. Um, they can use they can pull up to places where they can use fixed antennas uh, that were already erected in site and so on. However, uh, they cannot use their scores uh, to enter in in the club competition. So that's a little bit uh, about um, 
the history of the rules and so on, but uh, there are more uh, nuances in between, which I will show you in a bit. What I do want to talk about is equipping the basic and the sophisticated rover, and then we'll go on to some of the activities of the rovers and the impact um, of their scores and what we think the future may bring. I threw this picture in to show you um, some of the homebrew microwave equipment which was used by the um, W2SZ rover group. And as you can see, um, they used uh, the 1152 megahertz uh, oscillators and multipliers, but they used a 5.595 megahertz IF receiver, and so uh, their signals were generally uh, far removed from the uh, typical, uh, say, 1296.1 or uh, 903.1 uh, or 2304.1 um, uh, uh, chat uh, areas that uh, are so popular. And uh, unless you had some extraordinary equipment, uh, you could not communicate with one of uh, these uh, rovers uh, from the uh, Greylock group. However, they had a wonderful mountaintop location and they could hear a whisper almost from any mountaintop. And uh, for those of you who haven't operated the microwaves, you don't need a heck of a lot of power. Uh, 10 or 20 milliwatts uh, often is all you need with a good antenna that provides lots and lots of gain. So uh, roving is what I call addressing many new challenges. And why, why do people become rovers? I certainly became a rover uh, because of my uh, geographic location uh, and the restriction uh, that I had broadcasting out west. Currently, I live in a CCR restricted community, and um, we are not allowed to have outdoor antennas. I do have a little wire dipole and a log periodic up in my attic, but uh, I'll show you a picture of my rover uh, in a little bit. And um, I have a lot of fun, uh, you know, going out and uh, and finding uh, exciting places to operate. Not that we have all those big mountains here. But uh, once you're out in the clear, it makes a heck of a lot of difference, uh, especially uh, in microwave operating. So uh, there's lots of things that you need to do if you're going to become a rover. And uh, one thing I always say is know what your expectations are. And um, it, it, it is very difficult to uh, plan a, a two-day or a one-and-a-half-day contest and cover uh, say more than 10 grids. Um, you have to account for traffic and uh, uh, weather and road conditions uh, and certainly uh, the operation of your vehicle. On the other hand, there have been rovers uh, in the Midwest who started, uh, say, south in Texas, uh, go up an interstate, and uh, I think the record is covering 22 grids uh, during the contest. Um, However, that's uh, a lot of uh, operating in motion and certainly requires more than, uh, more than one person in the vehicle. So uh, I think that it's uh, critical to plan the route, the gear, and the power source. Um, you know, most of us will use uh, batteries, uh, that is the uh, uh, deep discharge uh, marine batteries, uh, often with a, a battery booster, a voltage booster. Uh, that will keep the voltage constant at 13.8 volts if you need that. Uh, most of the equipment runs better between uh, 12 and uh, 14 volts. And once your batteries start to get depleted, uh, the equipment is not so happy. So uh, having a, a small generator, uh, which I have used periodically, uh, is often helpful. Uh, currently what I do is I continue to run uh, the vehicle engine and charge uh, my batteries through a, um, a, uh, a, a switch to keep uh, my power up. Planning the route is extremely important also. You probably ought to go and see where you're going to be before you try and go up there and operate. Um, this is especially true in the winter. Uh, many roads are impassable because of snow or ice, especially if you're going up to a high location. And in the summer, uh, you need to account for uh, shore and beach crowds, uh, picnickers, and uh, weather uh, 
roads are gated or chained uh, during certain times of the year or getting special permission to operate uh, on those uh, on those properties. Nothing is more disappointing than to pull up at a place and have a uh, uh, state trooper or local police or the owner uh, come up to you and say you need to move. Um, certainly the gear I think and having a, uh, a what I call dry run and one of my famous uh, quotes from one of my friends is if, if it doesn't work well in the driveway, it's not going to work any better in the field. So uh, that is also, um, I, th I think, a very good uh, thing to remember, to uh, check things out before you go. Um, having uh, Assembling the station and antennas, I'm very lucky because I have a dedicated rover van. Uh, the station is permanently assembled in there. The antennas are placed uh, uh, on right before I uh, go out, and we have a series of beacons that I can check out my uh, radios. Uh, we also have Monday night nets, which run on all bands uh, through 10 gig. Uh, you can find local contacts to make sure everything's working. I redlined fasten everything in place, and uh, you you will learn very quickly that you if you have things that aren't uh, fastened down, uh, that is. Um, uh, with all kinds of uh, potential uh, bungee cords or uh, or brackets and so on, that um, if you have a sudden stop or going up a hill, uh, you certainly don't want things to move. And that includes uh, the microphones, the keys, your computer, uh, your logging computer, or even the papers and pencils. Um, fasten everything down that you're going to use. Uh, logging, I personally use a laptop. And um, I think this is very handy. Some laptops are um, radio noisier than others. Uh, you ought to test it out and make sure it doesn't give you a lot of uh, uh, problem. There are several logging programs that are available either for purchase or for free on the web. Personally, I use KM Rover. That's one developed by W3KM, who is one of our club members. You have to think about creature comfort, uh, food and drink. Um, if you're going to be out on the road, you want to uh, perhaps uh, have a reservation for overnight if you're going to be away from home, and make sure that you get some sleep. Uh, there is nothing like being uh, overtired and on the road and operating uh, and then getting into some difficult situation uh, where um, you uh, lose control of the vehicle or um, run your antennas into a low-hanging uh, low branch or a low-hanging uh, gasoline uh, uh, station. So um, I often, I, I also carry uh, what I call the um, uh, two most important things, a small camp toilet. I, I bought it from Sports Authority, I think, for about 10 bucks. Um, and once you have it in, in the van, I've never had to use it, so I guess it's a... Uh, it, it, it's a preventive thing, um, and uh, and so on. So uh, there are lots of uh, McDonald's that I can stop at uh, and use the facilities, and certainly uh, uh, um, get some uh, chow at uh, various places or carry my cooler with me. Uh, test run certainly that goes without uh, uh, um, uh, saying, but uh, it's important to do it before you get out there on some isolated uh, uh, spot. Now, once uh, you've decided to go roving, announcing your activity, and um, that is on the web, there's a uh, rover, um, there's a rover reflector, but also the VHF contesting reflectors, I think, which people are very familiar with, um, will, uh, uh, you, you can see uh, who's going where. Personally, I announce my general route, and I always say uh, weather and weather and conditions permitting. Um, and I generally do not do any schedules, although there are some people who are very rigid and keep right on schedule. Uh, personally, I sort of go with the flow. If six meters is open, it's very different. Uh, if uh, and so on and so forth. Um, carry some tools, some spares. I carry an information handout when the uh, police pull up and say, excuse me, what are you doing here? And it uh, helps to explain. I carry my license, and um, 
I also have magnetic stickers on the side of my van uh, that say uh, radio communications. It's uh, from the ARRL and I think they're fairly inexpensive. Lastly, uh, I say have a plan B. Uh, and that means if something happens, if uh, you know, I got a flat tire um, uh, 10 minutes uh, away from the home and my whole, uh, I had to uh, wait because I couldn't get the spare down. <laughs> it, it was one of those things where it was a three or four hour pause. And so, um, you know, be flexible. That's the most important thing. It's very easy, by the way, now. Um, on the left hand side, I'm showing my Scoutmaster GPS, uh, which gives a six digit grid so you know exactly where you are. Um, on the right hand side, I'm showing um, an, an app called Ham Square, uh, which is a smartphone app, and I think there are at least uh, uh, three or four of them. Uh, which um, can show your exact lat long and uh, certainly your six-digit grid. So this is a, a very nice tool to have. Uh, here I am uh, way back in the early 90s uh, as a VHF rover, and people would say this is a sort of a stop and shoot uh, type of uh, operation. Uh, that is that the uh, antennas were uh, packed up on that little homemade uh, car top carrier I had and the 10-foot uh, poles were inside the van. Uh, the radios were all on the um, uh, in the rear of the station wagon. Those two uh, dishes in the background are uh, it's an abandoned AT&T uh, uh, relay site so they're really not um, uh, they're really not mine. But uh, this is uh, a fun roving and um, here is the almost the same setup, and that's my son N1XKT is a rover. Uh, he roves by himself now. Uh, winter is a lot more difficult. Um, just a brief note about rover sites. Uh, you have to go to at least two to become a rover, and I think these are various things to think about uh, when you're out on the road. And um, hopefully this uh, will be recorded and you can see uh, what the issues are. So I won't dwell on this slide. Um, here's a very sophisticated rover, which uh, the N2JMH, uh, they had power masts uh, with uh, rotors front and back. It's a two operator setup. Uh, these were from the Rochester area. And uh, if you go on the web and Google Psycho Rover, N2JMH, uh, you'll get a great video of what uh, they, they had done. Um, so let's talk about some must-have uh, basics. Um, at least you have to have one of these two bands, and both are, are very important, six and two meters. Um, certainly, uh, a lot of us have the uh, ability to have these multi-band uh, rigs or multiple transverters. Uh, you have to think about um, whether you're going to use omni or directional antennas, certainly um, the directionals give you a lot more um, capability of DX uh, type contacts, uh, but um, you have to think about turning the vehicle or turning the antenna. And uh, considering uh, whether you're going to go low power, uh, 5, 10 watts, or whether you're going to uh, be able to run uh, something in the 100 or even, I run 400 watts on 2 meters. Uh, that's my, my, the most power that I have for one band. But um, I'm running at least 100 watts on all other bands up through uh, 1296. And here is a picture of my Rover van. You can see the uh, magnetic uh, logos on the side. Uh, I have a homemade uh, K1DS uh, plate in the front. Um, and you can see how the antennas are stacked. A lot of people say, well, well, you have to be concerned about the stacking distance, and the answer is you do the best under the circumstances. I'll show you some other pictures where people have very wide stacks, and by the way, this gets lowered down. The six-meter moxon comes off the top with about two feet of uh, mast, and then the whole um, mast gets lowered down uh, into the vehicle for travel. Uh, you can see the 5 and 10 gig dish on the back with its independent rotor and uh, a couple of uh, FM whips uh, for 222 and for uh, 2 meters. 
Uh, here is a little shot of the inside of my van. Um, what you can see on the right is an FT736R. I use that for the uh, four bottom bands. On the very uh, far right, uh, right behind the driver's seat, there's the two FM boxes. Uh, across the bottom, I have a series of uh, marine batteries. The next shelf up are the amplifiers uh, for most of the bands. On the shelf immediately uh, under the uh, operating area uh, are many of my microwave transverters and their amplifiers. Um, you can see the control boxes for the two rotors and how the rigs are um, uh, contained within a uh, bracketing area. Uh, everything else is screwed down onto the uh, operating table. And um, there's an FT, uh, here is, let's see, right here is my FT100, which is an IF for the microwaves, my microwave uh, IF switching, and uh, generally right here is where I put the computer. Um, this is the uh, amps and volts uh, for charging my batteries from uh, the alternator of the band. And this is the switch that switches the uh, power in uh, from from the uh, main alternator battery uh, to uh, this these batteries underneath uh, uh, the operating table. I threw this one in because um, you also have plenty of uh, very simple rovers out there. Um, you can see his uh, six meter Moxon is a little misaligned. Uh, uh, it, 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 to to the other um, to the other uh, beams, but uh, this is how a lot of uh, rovers get started. And uh, you can see that he's brought an umbrella because it's pretty hot out there at these parking lots, and he's got a little operating table and uh, where he's doing his logging. Um, here is again is a more sophisticated rover, and you can see the mechanics of how he uh, keeps all of his antennas. Uh, while he's in motion and then when he's operating. And I, I, I think there are lots of variations depending on what kind of vehicle you may have available to yourself and whether it's a dedicated rover or something where uh, you have to put a car top carrier on and a uh, uh, hitch. So a lot of people also ask, um, you know, are rovers gaining traction? Are we gaining or losing rovers? And what I did here is I took the total rover log submitted to the uh, ARRL uh, for uh, red is June, uh, green is September, and blue is January. And uh, the, the sort of dotted lines are the trend lines for them. So that you can see that January is uh, not quite as popular as June for roving, but, um, but clearly uh, there, are, there are about 80 uh, rovers, 80 to 100 rovers who go out in June and there are probably far more than that because only 50% of, uh, of people who are in contests submit their logs. I was going to show you um, a, a rover, for instance, and this is also with a power mast here. Uh, this was KB4IDC. And you can see how he got his six meter beam way up there, the microwaves, and then he has um, paired beams uh, for uh, several of the bands uh, for operating. Here's another uh, unique vehicle, uh, Brian ND3F, who is um, down in the mid-Atlantic. And you can see uh, what he's done uh, to get his antennas way up in the air. And, uh, you know, everywhere you go, there's kind of a tree line. So uh, getting above the tree line is pretty important. So I always say, what are your expectations? What are your resources? Can you operate uh, uh, CW? Can you operate the digital modes? Because these are becoming more and more popular. And it, some rovers even use um, uh, uh, software-defined radios with waterfall displays to spot people. I live on the East Coast. Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, VHF radio operators here. And I'm never uh, um, waiting for QSOs to come. On the other hand, if you're in the Dakotas or uh, uh, Nevada, um, you may find that uh, you have to uh, think more about what your route is going to be, where you're going to point, where you're going to go, and where you're going to get your um, QSOs and your multipliers. 
Um, over the years, uh, this, this had been the question. So are we gaining or losing rovers? And what I tried to do here is show you that uh, it's sort of been a sawtooth curve. Um, there have been uh, some years where uh, uh, big groups, that is the Southern California Contest Club or K5QE, uh, had groups of rovers go out and uh, kind of slaughtered the competition. Uh, um, and there are other years where, for instance, the Northern Lights Radio Society uh, had a rover mania, and um, they and there were also that year there were ten uh, Southern California Contest Club rovers out there, and and look at this, you know, um, over the year there were over 300 rover logs submitted, and this adds up the uh, four uh, the four uh, contests that is the January, June, August, and September. August being the UHF contest. So there are a lot of things that uh, changed over the years. For, the, for one year, there was no family roving allowed, uh, and then uh, family rovers were allowed again. Uh, again, the three rover classes came out in uh, 2008. So uh, you can see that there's a lot of things that affected uh, the, uh, the rovers. What I did here is do a logarithmic scale of the total submitted rover logs and um, you can use statistics to prove anything you want. We're continuing to gain and grow. And certainly people love rovers. Um, here we are at, at, at a rare grid. This is Harding's Beach in Chatham, uh, uh, Massachusetts. And we, we started the, um, the rove out there in June of uh, 04 because uh, there, there, are, there are very few fixed stations in FN51, uh, if any and certainly not on the microwaves. It is a mistake to go to a very rare grid on the East Coast at the beginning of the contest. Everybody's talking on six and two meters uh, at that time, and uh, we spent the first four hours uh, making 12 contacts uh, from uh, that QTH. Uh, it's actually very nice to get near the water, and uh, you can uh, have some very nice propagation uh, but it's better to go there on mid-Sunday afternoon when things are getting slow uh, and uh, everybody's looking to uh, get more microwave contacts. Um, Wayne, Wayne uh, Overbeck, who is N6NB, um, has collected certificates and, and won awards, uh, and he's made a splash on the West Coast with his Southern California Contest Club, and... Um, uh, he, under the new scoring rules, scored uh, 1.2 million or plus points, um, and uh, he had a group of rovers uh, that he worked with. Um, but the top June rover scores, as you can see, uh, except for uh, rare occasion, will run about two, two, 200 to 300,000 points. And now I'll explain why did Wayne do this. Well, how to score three million points and why. That is each of these rovers uh, that he did in the January 2004 team. Um, what they did was basically grid circling, which uh, you know allows you an unlimited number of uh, QSOs at that time uh, before the uh, rules were changed for rovers. And basically, what he's done is he stimulated a lot of um, uh, VHF and uh, uh, microwave activity uh, out on out on the West Coast, and his group of rovers grew, has grown from three to uh, to ten over the years, and they've garnered lots of uh, the awards from various categories. So I think we went over um, what these uh, uh, rover classes are, and they're certainly in the ARRL rules. And if you decide to become a rover, you have to decide. Uh, what category you're going to operate in and, um, and see, uh, see what kind of fun you can have, actually. Uh, I don't think you're going to go out in the first time and say, I'm going to win everything. Um, I always say be prepared. Uh, this is the K1RA uh, rover. Um, what happened is they wanted to have all the microwaves, um, all the microwaves and so on, but they started preparing so late that they only got the bottom four bands out. And on the other hand, here's me as a, uh, a rover in January of 03, and uh, what we're doing with the microwave dishes is snow scatter. So um, 
there, there's lots of things you can do, but on the other hand, after we got about two or three inches on the ground, my son, uh, N1XKT, said to me, Dad, I think we better get home while the getting is good. Um, what's happened with the Southern California contest group is that they have uh, enlarged their team. Here's 10 rovers that they're starting out for a uh, probably a 12 grid rove going from Port Arthur to uh, Texas out to California. And um, uh, here's uh, another uh, time that they did it. So there's a lot of antennas that you can make for yourself and um, uh, certainly you don't have to have uh, a lot. Once you get up on a high place, the, um, the uh, fixed stations will be looking for you. So um, again, just some pictures of what goes on. I, I did want to talk about what's called the, the Rover Toolbox here, uh, which uh, Wayne, uh, it's an expensive toolbox because inside of it, there are micro, there are uh, transverters for almost all the microwave bands. The neat thing is all you need to do is put a control line and an IF line uh, and, a, and a rotor line up here and everything turns so you don't have to worry about coax bending and uh, rotor loops and so on and so forth. And uh, here's uh, one of the uh, certificate winners for a, a few years, Carrie. Uh, has done very well. So let's talk about uh, the entry groups and uh, you know what groups should you think about entering in. Um, certainly there are very few unlimited rovers now. Uh, the limited rovers are probably about half and the ro regular rovers are about half of the entries and here you have the numbers underneath at least for uh, five of the last um, five of the last uh, eight years. Um, here just uh, one other rover and this rover has retired. Uh, you can see John W1RT is fixing his uh, military mast. Um, this is one of those uh, three or four section jobs which can get up about 40 feet. Um, and um, any, at any rate you don't have to be on the top of a mountain. Any place which is nice and clear uh, is good for operating. So what do rovers score? Uh, here I picked a, uh, a January of, uh, of 13. Here you have limited rover scores um, and most of the limited rovers scored less than 5,000 points. Uh, here you have some extraordinary activity, KJ9K, uh, who won the category with 20,000. Of the routine rovers, uh, the vast majority were under 20,000 points. And then you had a lot of, uh, uh, this group here is all the Southern California Contest Club uh, that um, uh, uh, talk a lot to each other as rovers. And here uh, again is June. June's a lot more active. The rover scores about, um, uh, most of the gang was under 50,000, okay? And here is limited rover scores. You can see there are a lot more, uh, maybe up to about 20,000. So uh, June, June is a lot more score than January, but you can see where the distribution of uh, points are. Um, some people go to extremes, and this is Wayne, N6NV. I think this picture sort of speaks for itself. Um, this was a homemade, I won't say a homemade, this is a kit trailer, I believe, from Harbor Freight or some similar source. The radios are here. Uh, he controls it from here. Uh, this is a tilt over crank up and here's your antennas and again once you're out in the clear you don't need a heck of a lot of power or a big antenna uh, it uh, does very well so I wanted to uh, get to the closure and talk about the new VHF rule in rovers in terms of self spotting and uh, I just put this up this is the verbatim new 1.16 rule and, and just basically it says you are permitted to use self-spotting and basically you can do this in any way you want including cell phone and um, have rovers use this. Well the first time it was used is in this June contest uh, which took place uh, uh, two weekends ago and um, personally I used my cell phone to alert various stations I'm, uh, you know, uh, now uh, ready to uh, uh, communicate on uh, all bands because I'm in a new grid 
and point your antennas uh, this in this direction. And I'll be listening on 145, uh, 144 dot whatever, so that um, it, it you can talk about the bands, the frequencies, the modes, and the transmitting. See all all those sorts of things you can do now. And whether you do it with uh, APRS, that is the Automatic uh, uh, Position Reporting System, uh, whether you do it by uh, spotting yourself on the various uh, web chats or tweets, uh, I asked a number of people, how did it work for you? And basically, the large fixed stations loved it uh, when they could uh, see openings or uh, try and make some long-haul contacts. But rovers who were on the road said, you know, uh, I was too busy doing other stuff to uh, to bother, so um, I th I think uh, the the um, um, results are not in yet on how people will use uh, the ability to do self spotting and whether it will make a big impact on the contesting. Um, well. Uh, this kind of wraps up. I think we're uh, uh, up to the question and answer uh, uh, period, so I hope that um, uh, somehow uh, I'll find a lot of you on the bands and we'll be able to, uh, uh, to work in the future. So uh, with that, Ken, I'll turn it back to you, and uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer them. Okay, Rick. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so here's Chance. If you uh, have a question for Rick, uh, go ahead. Type it in the questions box, hit send, and I'll pick it up here and uh, pass it along to him. You know, I, you had mentioned about, I guess, pulling into McDonald's with your rover station, and I, I wonder, you probably get a few looks when you uh, pull in there as well, don't you? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, the, the, answer, uh, the answer is, of course, everybody is curious. And I, I think a lot of, a lot of people say, um, uh, are, are you contacting ET? Uh, you know, are you, are you talking to Mars? Um, and if I do it along a, a roadway, uh, a lot of times uh, people will slam on the brake thinking that you're uh, tracking them. <laughs> the radar. Um, but uh, most, Im most importantly, I think that, uh, again, uh, we are an amateur radio operator. I have an informational trifold handout uh, which talks about uh, what VHF communications are, emergency communications, and... Uh, uh, why I'm a rover, and I also have uh, uh, the ARRL URL and my club URL on it, so that if they want more information, uh, that they, they can look us up. Uh, it's very, very important, I think, to be extraordinarily um, uh, respectful when the police pull up. And I've had over the years, and again, I've been roving for 25 years, um, after 9-11, uh, the road, everybody has a cell phone and everybody's reporting, there's a weird guy with a weird van, and if you'll remember, um, those, those guys who were shooting people out of uh, the, the back of a, uh, a sedan, but it was reported to be a white van, I can't tell you how many stops uh, I've had made, and uh, when they're state troopers, they've got the hand right on the pistol, ready and uh, approach the car. Um, I had an incident, uh, I was down in, uh, in Maryland with uh, one of my uh, colleagues who decided he wanted to come and rove with me to see what it was like. And uh, Jim is blind, okay? So he was sitting in the front seat and uh, logging for me and um, I'm in the back, uh, as you saw, and I'm facing the radios. And what happened is that two uh, state troopers pulled up and um, when, when they did, of course, Jim didn't see them because he's blind. And uh, so, you know, I kind of noticed them out of the corner of my eye and I got out and I, uh, you know, hello, officer, um, you know. And so there was a lot of explanation. Okay, well, they're not looking for explanation. License and registration, please. And they run it through the computer. And, of course, Jim doesn't have a driver's license because he's blind but he does have a personal identification card. So that was the, 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 the funniest thing was the trooper said, well, we drove past you before and we waved to, to, to and nobody looked up. And I said, well, that's because Jim is blind. So um, at, at any rate, uh, 
I, they always have the upper hand and you never want to get into trouble and so I don't like to be cutesy with them. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, got a couple questions here, so let's try to run through these quick. Um, Aaron is asking, how did you seal the uh, hole in the roof of your van uh, where the mast comes out? Uh, very good. I took the uh, rubber from a plunger, and um, I, I trimmed it the best that I could. I also took a, um, a, a PVC-type screw coupling to um, put it around the hole so it doesn't chafe the aluminum mast. And it's not, uh, it's water resistant, it's not waterproof, but I try not to stay out in uh, big time downpours. Okay, uh, Donald's wondering, um, do you do more stop and shoot or run and gun? Um, I do not. Um, I, I have basically been a solo operator. Occasionally we've done the family with my son. Uh, but now he's uh, moved out of the house and married and uh, does his own roving. So uh, he was able to operate uh, while I was driving at times, but uh, basically I'm a stop, uh, stop and shoot. Um, I do not uh, talk on the radio while I'm in motion. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm very much a safety first. I have uh, have a collection of uh, bad things that have happened to rovers out there. Um, but um, basically I want to try and avoid all of those. So uh, for me, I generally cover uh, six to eight grids in a contest. I covered 10 one time, and uh, because we have a lot of VHF activity up here east, uh, it's very fulfilling. Okay, good. Um, Jared has a question. He says, what comes first, the fixed stations with microwaves or the rovers with microwaves? If there are no fixed stations in the area on the microwaves, what can a rover do to help kickstart activity in the area? Well, I, th I think, again, that's what the uh, Southern California Contest Club has done. And if you, um, again, look up N6NB's webpage, uh, you'll learn a lot about stimulating rover activity with rover-to-rover uh, -rover contact. And that is something that we have done as a club. Uh, the more technical people, as they've graduated up the bands and so on, or improved uh, their stations, uh, we have a lot of loner microwave gear uh, that uh, we try and give out. And that's what the W2SZ group has also done, uh, you know, to try and encourage uh, 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 people to uh, get more active on the higher bands. Um, in general, uh, those uh, big fixed stations, uh, whether they're the KAGP group or the W2SZ or W3CCX, you'll always find them pounding away because they have 12 to 20 operators at their uh, site. And um, they're the easiest to find, the easiest to work. And I, I think that you, you have to uh, get the thrill, though, of working some of the weaker guys, and I have done that. Uh, on the microwaves, and it's very, very exciting to work some rover-to-rover -rover contacts that were not sort of prearranged uh, by gang roving or, or, or grid circling. Okay, uh, Scott, K0MD is wondering, how do you protect yourself from RF exposure? Um, well, basically, the, the, all the antennas are outside, and I, I'm inside, so I think that... Um, I think that the metal frame of the car is uh, my best protection. Um, so I, I haven't measured the RF field inside uh, inside the van, but uh, may, maybe I ought to now. Thanks. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, well, that's it for questions. I um, wonder if there's anything else you want to pass along, Rick, before we close it up. Well, I, I certainly um, uh, wanted, wanted to talk about some unique incidents. Um, there, some of these have been written up in QST, or uh, I, for about 10 years, I wrote up the results of the uh, June contest for QST. Uh, I currently have been writing up the uh, moon bounce uh, uh, results uh, for QST. But uh, so, so a lot of people wrote me uh, a lot of stories. But one of the one of the most significant was uh, a guy who went uh, up a hill with a rover. And um, what happened was, and, and this was in June, it happened to be probably in the Northwest, uh, as I remember, and it snowed overnight. 
and uh, he basically was stranded up there uh, because um, you, you know a lot of it turned to to mud and and he couldn't get out of the snow and uh, he I think he wound up uh, you know needing uh, to get a tow but you, you know there's a lot of these uh, unusual hilltops where where tow trucks don't come um, so I think you you have to be uh, uh, very circumspect about where you're going and who you let know where you're going to be uh, so that you don't um, get into that kind of trouble. Um, I know I lost the transmission halfway up a hill uh, one time, and um, you know I, I needed to be uh, uh, trailer um, uh, uh, flatbedded uh, about a hundred miles home uh, from from that situation, of course, and buy a new transmission uh, for that van. But um, I, that's why I say always have a plan B. Um, I've had a leaky gas tank, uh, which has uh, been a problem, and one year I did fracture my main mast, um, uh, found, a, found a pothole which jolted the whole van, and, and so uh, there, there's a lot of things which need taking care of. Um, and one other thing that uh, I think is very important is the use of lock washers. Um, so uh, you will find that screws tend to uh, tend to uh, unwind themselves from your antennas, from your mounts, from your radios, uh, and so on when you're on the road. I've probably put on uh, probably maybe 50 or 60 thousand miles over the years roving, and um, indeed carrying a toolkit, checking the mounts, and so on uh, becomes uh, pretty important. I'm, I'm looking over my notes. I just want to um, see if there's there's anything uh, else that I wanted to add. Uh, oh, the the other the, there's one last thing, and that is um, the courtesy when rover meets rover. That is, uh, two guys wind up at the same spot, and you know the I was here first, or you know oh I won't bother you. I'll be on a different band, and of course it's uh, it's misery. Um, basically, the guy that's there first should have the privilege. On the other hand, he shouldn't hog the spot forever. Uh, if you're a rover, you know, have your fun for a couple hours and, you know, let somebody else also enjoy it or, you know, uh, work out, uh, well, I'll, I'll go to the next grid and then I'll come back here uh, and so on. I, I think a lot of that has been handled very gentlemanly over, over time. So thank you very much, uh, Ken, for the opportunity. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, contact me, it's um, uh, I didn't put on my uh, my uh, email, but it's uh, just R I C K my name Rick and then one D S. So it's a I took out the two Ks. It's only one K. Rick one D S at hotmail dot com. So if anybody wants to uh, flip me a uh, a question or comment, I'll be glad to uh, uh, speak or respond. Okay, Rick, very good. Well, once again, uh, thank you for taking the time to put this together and uh, for being the uh, first one to step up and uh, uh, offer to uh, help out with some uh, VHF uh, presentations here. Um, as you will be reminded, like I said, in about 24 hours or so, you'll just get an email uh, from us thanking Thank you for attending. Um, we have recorded this webinar. It will be posted on the WWROF webpage. I see Joel's isn't up there yet, so I've got to get with the webmaster and get that uh, squared away. But um, do me a favor and just pass that along to uh, you know your friends, uh, club members, or whatever, and uh, have them come and uh, check it out. And again, uh, I'm open for uh, suggestions if uh, if you'd like to do more of these things. So, with that, thank you, Rick. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, have a great rest of the week, and uh, we'll see you later. Bye bye.